single-handedly broke up my marriage. You're an awful person. You're 24 years old. Why would I listen to you? Why would you be giving therapy and advice to people who clearly need it? It doesn't make any sense, Ari. This is a horrible idea. You're listening to you listening to unlicensed, 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 unlicensed therapy with Ari Mendes. Ari Mendes. Are we recording? Yeah, it's rolling. I always hate shows like this that they trick you into starting. <laughs> like you start talking, I mean, and you're thinking it's not on air, and then the next thing you know, just so you know. I'm not TMZ. If you want something cut out, I'll cut it out. I say that to all my people too, and then yeah. I and then I clip it and put it somewhere else <laughs> that they don't know about. I'm, yeah, I'm if you guy. say the N word, that's going on the internet. Yeah. Well, I've said it. You can probably find it. I've said it on national. Have Soviet. you? Yeah, yeah. That's pretty badass. Uh, no, it was back when it wasn't badass. It's badass if you say it now. It's also <laughs> ignorant if you say it now. But it's uh, it was like quasi, quasi uh. Uh, acceptable. I wouldn't say acceptable. It was like, ooh, you're edgy. You just said it. You are edgy. One of the best jokes I've ever seen is Zach Galifianakis has a joke mm -hmm. that he says it. Is it the sand? The volleyball yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's one of my favorite jokes ever. It's a, it's just a brilliant <laughs> joke. Yeah. And it's it's harmless. It's harmless. And you you know Zach is like, you know the liberals love him. And so you'd never see that joke or never see him get canceled for that joke. And Zach shouldn't be canceled. Zach's like the greatest guy. And now me saying this, this will be like the clip that starts it. I'll be the Hannibal Burris that brought down Bill Cosby. <laughs> when uh, Before I started comedy, I listened to a lot of comedy podcasts, as I think a lot of you probably did. A lot of newer comedians did. Yeah, I didn't. And <laughs> you're not newer. I got news for you. You're on the older side now. <laughs> the oldest side. I think. <laughs> no, not the, definitely not that. So I was listening to Greg Fitzsimmons podcast, uh -huh. and he interviewed Zach Galifianakis, and Zach Galifianakis told the story of basically him saying the N-word to Chris Rock, cause, and they became friends, and it was not racist at all. But I, as a fan, took a clip of that story, because it's a really funny story. With Louis C.K., right? Yeah. In the oh. wings of a theater. Talking yeah, about, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and what was it? Do you remember the so story? So he was on stage. Uh, he was on the wings of a theater. Chris Rock's on stage. It's Zach. And Louis kind of bringing Zach into the inner circle of like comedy back then. Yeah. So he's kind of introducing everybody, to, to Zach, to everybody. And Zach's on stage and he says, who let this on stage fill in the blank? And Louis dies laughing. And then. Right. That's what it was. Yeah. 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 Then backstage, Louis says, you got this is my friend, Zach. He said the funniest thing. He said, who let this black guy on stage? And Zach goes, that's not what I said. I said, who let this? And he rolled the dice and said it right to Chris's face. And Chris was like, I love this guy. Yeah. Yeah. Started laughing. Yeah. So that story was told on on Fitz Dog Radio. Yeah. I'm a fanboy, So I take a clip of it and I upload it. This is before there were now there's clips all over of podcasts. This is before there were yeah. podcast clips. And I put it on YouTube. And it started getting, you know, like 6,000 downloads. Not a lot, but something. And all the comments liked the story. It was a good story. I get an email from Greg's legal team saying, take that shit down. Or no, it was Zach's legal team. Take that shit <laughs> down sense. immediately. That's hilarious. Yeah. yeah. And That's, I did. And I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm a fan. I don't know mm -hmm. how these guys, I've never been in that situation that I'm not big enough to get canceled, you know, like where people try to cancel me. If they do... And if I ever was, they could do it very easily. Like I'm, there's a million, they, they wouldn't have to look hard. They'd be like, we got them in like 10 minutes. They're like, we found it. Um, so they could get me very easily. I'm just not. You don't care. No, I'm not big enough for it to happen. Yeah, yeah. And I also, I'm an open book. Like I'm like, hey, you, you need it? I'll show you right where it is. Go on my Comedy Central special. I said it. You know, would like, you say being an open book, because that's part of what makes you funny and you, would you say that's helped you overall or hurt you overall? I don't know. I don't know where I am. I don't know if I've <laughs> failed miserably or I've succeeded. You haven't failed miserably because like, you have a house in Malibu. Re, uh, it's not. It's Malibu adjacent, let's say. <laughs> it's, uh, it's more like Malabama. It's, um, I look at... Uh, what was I just watching? Uh, that that new show, Hacks, on HBO. I don't know if it's new or whatever. It is. One season. Yeah. Anyways, I, I was just watching the trailer, and she was talking about somebody saying that they worked hard or whatever. I hate when people in Hollywood are like, I worked so hard to get where I got, or I'm so – they were so talented. There are so many people 
that work in hard. this town that work so hard and are so talented. It's like, and then it's like, it's like saying, you know, like how many people from China are qualified to go to Harvard? There's like, so, so what is it that gets the one in over the other one? There's a lot of luck. A lot of luck, maybe a lot of cocaine at a bar with the right person. That's luck. Because, yeah. you know, I did cocaine with the wrong person. <laughs> you know, like I chose the hooker from Vegas. Um, you know, like that's it's just it's a lot of luck. You know, I was I've been around. But it also must be, you know, you know, that thing, too, because I've been around everyone. I've had a million opportunities. Like I was there when I first moved to New York. Zach was becoming a star. And that was like in 96. Mm -hmm. So like I watched mm -hmm. Zach. Like, the first time he was becoming a star. Yeah. But yeah. he was like, it, it was funny. When I moved to New York, the stars of New York were like Louis. This is 96. Yeah. Louis Fitzsimmons, Attell, Zach, um, Janine Garofalo. There was a whole, it was Luna Lounge. And it was the whole start of mm -hmm. the alt scene. And I used to go in there and just feel like the, like, I don't belong like these guys are all so cool and so hip. And I was like from like a upper middle class neighborhood of Pittsburgh. And I was just like, I don't fit here. And it was just so awkward. And Zach was a star. But already. then did you eventually fit in with that crowd? Never. Never? Still to this day. I don't feel like. It is funny to hear you say that because all the people you just described who are very funny comedians and successful are nerds and you're not a nerd. Yeah. You're like a cool dude. You surf. You wear flat brim hats. I do wear, I get a lot of shit for the flat brim and I just. It's, <laughs> no, but I'm just saying you're like, oh, they were so cool and I didn't fit in. But really, probably in high school, it was the other way around. Yeah, probably. And I'm probably paying for it. It's <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I probably put them all in a locker at one point. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I was, I will say this. I was the, maybe the dorkiest of the cool group in high school. So I was the I was like the gatekeeper of the cool group because I was like, hey, I'm I'm lucky to be in here. And then some nerds started to come up and kind of approach the cool group and you're like, get out of here. There's no, no I, I would I would slowly let them in. I would kind of <laughs> I was the I was the the, the uh, Schindler, you know, I was sneaking them, you know, like I was <laughs> I don't know if that's the word for it. I was I was <laughs> I was recruiting. I'd always find like the nerd that I liked that was mm -hmm. really funny. And they'd be like, I think I can get you into the cool group because you're really funny. I just got to show them your talent. Mm -hmm. And I would show the cool kids how funny this kid was. And boom, I'd have a new one. And I have a buddy who we just had a reunion. And I just said to him, we were like all arguing on text. And I was like, I brought you into this group. I can take you out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's only been like 20 some years and I will I will remove you. <laughs> so uh, were they all surprised when you became a comedian? No, I. but I always say I had four friends at least that were funnier than me. Like I have definitely, they were just smarter than you. So they didn't become comedians. Probably yeah. <laughs> like I, my dream was to kind of make it and then bring them all in. And I wish they had done it with me. If we had all done it together, we'd probably be a lot more Like we probably would have made it, you know, yeah. like to that big, you know, because they were so talented and, you know, you, you, you know, when you did their safety in numbers and when mm -hmm. you have a group of you, there's a force like you look at like the guys who made workaholics or something like that, like a group that. Works yeah, together. totally. And my friends all went off. One of them's like like a head of a bank in New York right now. He's like number three at a bank and they're all doing well, but this just wasn't their thing. And well, I, maybe they should give you some of that well doing well money. Yeah, they always say that. They're always yeah. like, hey, why don't we invest in you? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to lose your money. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. I, one friend gave me $350,000 to make a film and it never came out. So, yeah. Yeah. But the movie got the money got spent. The money all got spent. Oh, wow. Yeah. How, what's that like? I had when dinner you with them two nights ago. We didn't bring it up. <laughs> when was this? This was in uh, 2005 to about 2009. So he knows on... it's not coming back. It was his fault that oh, it didn't okay. come out. Oh, okay. Because he just, he stopped funding it when it was like at the crucial time. We were like, you know, we're like running down the field. And we're at like the 10 yard line. And he was like, nah, I'm pulling the plug. Okay. So then he can't blame you. Yeah. And you're still friends. Yeah. It's all good. And it was a tax write off for him. So would you do something like that again? I would like Probably to. Probably a big learning I experience. Have, you know, everybody says you got to like take big chances. It's just like, it just knocks the wind out of you when they, I've failed so many times. 
that, you know, I've had so many development deals and pilots and things that just never happen. And they say, keep flipping over stones and I'm still doing it. I still go to the meetings. I still, but at a certain point, I just look at where all my successes come from. And it's like, why don't I just go with where it's working and go away from where it's not? But I, you know, and I think this, and I think everybody in Hollywood, you hear them, they all say the same shit. Mm -hmm. It's like, wait a minute, shut up, Matt Damon. <laughs> you know, like he's like, oh, you know, you get knocked down a thousand, a million times. Like, no, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> Matt Damon do. hit a home run the first time. Yeah. Good I, I, let, me, let me show you what it's like to get knocked down. <laughs> Builds character, though. I guess. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I mean, look, I'm. I don't think I'd like you if you were successful, like super successful. But you would pretend to like them. No, I'll tell yeah. you. Yeah. Well, it probably wouldn't have been. You, I feel like, you know, you're nice. You're one of the nicest guys. But if you were a multi-gazillionaire touring, you know, theater act, you probably wouldn't be that nice. I think I would now. You would now. I think now the long process that I've gone through, I have, I understood, I understand everybody's plight. When I first started, I got a little bit of success, like. It was creepy how quickly it came because everybody told me like it's impossible it's an impossible business and within a year of new york city i got a deal to, i was hosting shark week and then i got booked like 40 commercials and wow i had tons of cash i was doing colleges i was on comedy central you're killing it killing it and i remember driving really fast and drinking a lot because i was <laughs> like i need a buzz like life is this is too easy Wow. Like everybody told me this was going to be so hard and I'm crushing it. Yeah. And then it all came crashing down. And if it had continued like that, you'd probably hate me. <laughs> but the fact that I've seen the struggle makes me appreciate every single person around me and what they're going through and makes me empathetic. Um, You've probably told this story a million times, but I've never heard it. When, why did it all come crashing down? I don't know. I think part of it was my fault. Um, I had a, we were going to make a show. I was working with, I admit, I went to New Faces in Montreal mm -hmm. and I bombed really badly. Damn. Bad. Why? Or like how, why that, why that uh, happened? I think, I think cause I put so much pressure on myself. Um, and you know, you do two shows. Mm -hmm. And so the first show, uh, I was first on the showcase. Okay, so that could be that could be the reason for the first show. And the show started at 5 p.m. And Anthony Clark was hosting. And I just remember like looking at the lineup and going like, why am I first? This is so unfair. And they're like, it's just how the cookie crumbles. And it's like, or, you know, my manager didn't fight well enough or whatever. Yeah, whoever. And they were like, it's okay. It flips the next night. Like they take like, say there's like 10 on the show. They go one through five at the first, and then you're sixth on the next one. So I was sixth the next night. Mm -hmm. So if I was first now, I know how to handle it, and I could, I could figure it out. How many years in were you at this point? Three or four. Okay. And I just got in my head and was like, this is impossible, blah, 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 and I just bombed, bombed. And then I just like... I remember just walking through Montreal by myself, like no one could find me. I just like went into this day. Yeah, you were and, feeling like shit. Oh my God. It's one of the worst feelings I've ever had. And then I came back the next day, like Rocky, like I'm going to kill it. And I killed. Oh, good. No good though, because they already, you're only- They made ones. up their mind. They already made up their mind. You had a stink on you. I had a terrible stink on me. Like I walked around the festival just like nobody wants to talk to me. And then it gets in your head and- and so I, I was just so frustrated and my manager at the time, I was, it was weird. I manager agents, they were all weird. Um, I've been through everybody, but mm -hmm. my manager did the best thing in the world. People used to make fun of this manager. I don't want to say his name, but he's a great fucking guy and he's super smart. He had his assistant call everyone in Hollywood and I was living in New York and said, are you going to the Montreal Comedy Festival? And if they were like, yeah, he's like, I want you to see my client. If they said no, he said, okay, I'm gonna send you his tape. And he's like, the tape never bombs. So he sent my tape to everyone. And then right after Montreal, they sent me out to do the rounds to go meet everyone. Mm -hmm. 
And the ones I was meeting with, 90% of them just saw the tape. Right. They didn't know you bombed. Yeah. Because uh, I have a funny story about the bomb. Uh, but I get a call from Glenn Padnick, who made uh, Seinfeld, Castle Rock Entertainment. And he's like, I just went in this meeting. He's like, you, you're the character. And you've got these friends and this and that. And then well, there's a show here and your sister and you're blah, blah, blah. And, and he's like, uh, you know, my manager was like, don't pitch a show. Just talk to them. And I did. And he's like, I see it right here. And he's like, hold on. I'm calling Warner Brothers. We're going to do. And I was like, holy shit. And I walked out. My manager's like, you're getting a deal like this. How did this? Holy shit. But I went to one meeting at Paramount and I knew the uh, talent exec there. And she was like a friend of the family, weirdly. And my family has like zero Hollywood connections. And uh, this was like our only connection. And so she, uh, we had the big meeting and it didn't go well. And she goes, meet me downstairs. I'll go to lunch with you. And I'm like, okay. So I'm sitting downstairs and I can hear them talking. And I hear the head of Paramount go, did anybody see him at Montreal? And I hear this one girl go, I did. <laughs> and, and your friend's also hearing it. Yeah. So you're listening together, yeah. them talking and, about uh, how you suck. <laughs> and uh, he goes, how did he do? And she just goes, not good. And I mean, it was like uh, I got punched in the stomach. And yeah, I, you must. And I was supposed to meet this girl for lunch. I just ran out, got in my car and drove away. I was like, I can't, I can't be there. I can't go to lunch. I can't be any part wow. of it. And I think that was the day then after that, like the lowest I felt, I got the call that Castle Rock and Warner Brothers wanted to do this. And, uh, but so we started working on the show and working on getting a showrunner. And I've been there now probably four times and, um, where they're trying to get a showrunner, trying to create a show about me, blah, blah, blah. And it was funny. I had, at the time I was doing, I was on the show with Mark Marin called, uh, what was the name of it? I forget the show. It was some panel show on VH1. I had sold a show to FX called Balls. And I had, I had, I was, I had my own pilot with Comedy Central called Strap On. So you had like three things at the same time. At the same time. Strap yeah. On and Balls. Strap On and Balls. Yeah. <laughs> All innuendo shows. <laughs> and uh, it, it shows you where my comedy, level of my comedy. <laughs> so I, I did it with, I had all this stuff going on and I was in like Seinfeld's documentary. It was like so much was going on. Comedian? Yeah. I can't. And I got edited out of it. I was going to say, I was like, I'm in a bar. I can't remember. I'm in a bar in Hollywood, the rainbow. And I run into this guy and my, my agent had been like, oh, I was at the screening of comedian. It was so funny. That part you have with Seinfeld. And I'm like, oh, thanks. And I remember they called me to come in. They Seinfeld was cool. He paid everyone for that movie. Oh, nice. Like if you were in it, you got a check. So I went down, filled out my paperwork, got my check. Then I see this guy who's like one of Seinfeld's managers. We're talking and I said, oh, yeah, I'm in the film. And he goes, no, you're not. And I'm like, yeah, 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 I'm in the film. And he's like, no, you're not. I'm like, my agent told me he just saw a screening. He goes, what screening? I told him, he goes, oh, that was the last screening. He goes, they just cut 12 minutes. Damn. And I go, oh, fuck. So I'm gone from that. Then the VH1 show gets canceled. Then... Balls, this is right around 9-11. Balls doesn't, like, my agent called me and was like... Even Balls they cancel? Well, Balls was about sneaking into places. Like, if you don't have the balls uh, to do what we do, we are sneaking in, crashing all these places. Mm, so... That, yeah. yeah so my, my agent's 9/11. like, they don't want the show. Like, it's done. And then I was like, well, I, oh, and then the Comedy Central said this around this. I, I don't know about all the timelines about this, but it just seems to me that it all happened at the exact same time. But my show, my pilot was the same time like Chappelle's and Colin Quinn's like uh, tough, tough crowd. crowd. Yeah. We were like the three Comedy Central pilots. And I was like, they're never going to pick me up. And my agent was like, no, we think yours is the one that's going to go because you're the cheapest. And I was like, oh, he's like, that's what you have going for you. And I'm like, this show sucks. Like, I know I did the show. I didn't make it or create it. I was just in it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this sucks. Like, I was calling my manager from the set going, get me the fuck out of here. I don't want to. So that doesn't get picked up. The other two do. The VH1 show gets canceled. My FX show gets canceled. Like, doesn't, like, you know, they just, like, put it, put a bullet in it. 
Seinfeld cuts me out. And I'm like, well, I still get this, like the big money thing. I got this development deal. I got this. This is all going with Warner Brothers. And, yeah, you're like and, the big one. That's yeah, that's all that matters. All the, this is yeah. the one that is that everybody dreams of. And I was driving back from a gig in San Diego and my manager called me and he's like, uh, he's like, your writer walked, your showrunner walked. I go, what do you mean? He goes, he had a deal with uh, some other network or something. And I go, so? And he goes, so he's not going to do your show. And I was like, he had two deals. How do you do that? He's like, well, they take the deals and then they give the money back to show that they're not going. And I go, so let's get another one. And he's like, it's too late. And I'm like, what do you mean it's too late? He's like, it's over. The show's not going. Damn. And I was just like, so I really, for a minute, got like paranoid and thought that I was in a reality show. <laughs> and I thought that like Hollywood had gone, we're going to fuck with this guy and film him. Like, we're going to show him. You're going to see what happens to like, you know, somebody in the entertainment business when his life gets destroyed. <laughs> and we're just going to like build him up. And then break them down. And I started to think, like, is this a joke? Like, does everybody know about this? And uh, I would, I would like, try to call people and literally couldn't get people on the phone. So it was kind of this perpetual. Mm -hmm. And I was, like, digging a hole for myself. And you probably – I was probably giving off that energy, too, this, like, Damn. desperation. And so nobody wanted to come near me. And – this was probably at the time I was probably now in the business like five years because what this like took over time. Because I, I think I did Montreal in 2000. I started comedy in 96. So I did Montreal 2000. This is like 2001. Yeah. And I'm I'm like destroyed. And uh, when I was at Montreal, I met this British agent and the agent said to me, he was like, uh, hey, you should come do comedy in in England. And I was like, whatever, dude, I'm going to be a star. You know, like I was like mm -hmm. riding high in, in America. And I remember no one would take my calls. I called that agent on the phone and I was like, hey, dude. Um, you still got that London? Yeah, gig? you got any gigs for me? And he goes, yeah, I'm going to connect you to this guy. And yeah, just bump, bump, bump. The next thing you know, this guy sent me three months of work. He was like, here's your dates. And it was every night for three months. And I was like, I guess I'm going to England because I couldn't get catch cold here. So I went to England and I had the best fucking time ever. Mm -hmm. And I kept working over there and working and working and working. And I would go there, come back, go there, come back, go there. And they started sending me to like South Africa and France and Germany and China and uh, the Middle East. And I started performing in these like comedy clubs all over the world. Mm -hmm. And I was like, fuck Hollywood. Fuck them. They don't want me. I don't want them. And one night I was sitting at the comedy cellar table and I was talking to Chris Rock. And at this point, I'd been doing it for a bunch of years. I'd been all over the world. And he's like, yeah, I'm doing shows in London. And I was like, ooh, you know, like, mm -hmm. and he's like, yeah, and then I'm going to go to Australia. And I was like, ooh, <laughs> you know, like, here you are. You've been working all this time, like stuck in L.A. or New York, you know, and I've been all over the world. Like you, you're this big. You're this amazing. And he is He's like, to me, one of the greatest comedians of all time. Mm -hmm. But now you're going to get to do what I've been doing. Yeah. And granted, you're going to do it on a much bigger scale than I am. But it's like, we're going to see the same stuff and we're going to, you know. So I was like, maybe this like life experience is, is better than sitting around Hollywood waiting for that phone call that says you got the show or you didn't. So it look, it led me to Australia. I got a pretty good career in Australia and I met my wife there. So is I, your wife Australian? No, but she was American. She was living there. Got it. And it, I always look at it like if all of this shit didn't happen, I wouldn't have met her. I wouldn't have my amazing family. So I'm lucky to have what I have. And like you said, I'd probably be a dick, right? Now. <laughs> and so I'm glad that I'm not. I'm glad that I have this perspective that I have, that I understand how much of a struggle it is for everyone. And, uh, you know, like everybody out there is just looking for significance. I, uh, I was going to ask you about Australia because I, when I was, I want to say two or three years in a comedy, I met this Australian. I used to run a show at the Hooters on Hollywood Boulevard. I don't yeah. know if you ever did it. Pretty no. shitty show. Uh, good thing you didn't get to do it. I used to go yeah. there to watch Steeler games. Okay. Real shithole. Yeah. I was there three or four nights a week. I would bark for an hour before the show, handing out free tickets, and I would get to do 10 minutes. It was actually good because it was better than open mics. Right. 
So I met this Australian tourist who came to the show, watched me bomb. We made out for like a few hours mm -hmm. that night, and I was just smitten over her. So then I was I wanted to go see her, but I didn't want her to think that I was going to see her. So I put together just any shows I could get in yeah. Australia. Yeah. And went over there, did two weeks of shows. You know, was, they were all good shows, but they were they were they're bar shows. And right, I right, right. That's how I that. started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were good, and I was doing it. And it was great, and I saw her. But when I was there, your name kept popping up. It's like, oh, do you know who Eddie Ift is? He's so funny. Like he and you were doing, I think, theaters. Yeah, I, I've done a few theaters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were doing like big shows in Australia, so it made it just made me wonder. I was like, how did how it was, did that happen? That was a very yeah. lucky thing because so. Things were going well on the comedy club circuit in the UK. Um, they had kind of a boom going on. So I was just like, I was just like one of a, a ton of guys mm -hmm. that could do the job. Right. You know, like it wasn't like I was special or anything. It was like, hey, here's another headline. But there was so much work. Mm -hmm. There was so much work in England that it was like. If you, you were just, a good headliner, you could go over there and work. Yeah. And I don't know if I was a headliner before I went. I was kind of a feature act here in America mm -hmm. and over there I got to be a headliner and it was kind of just because I took this attitude of like yeah I can headline you know yeah. and and it made me a headliner when I came back here so and it's funny that's what I then made the movie about was traveling all over the world um but uh what what happened to Australia was I was working in the UK a lot and I was coming back to America and I was in stand-up New York I think it was one night and I meet this Australian comedian named James Smith, who's a really, really funny comedian. And we just hit it off and he was a good dude. And we were talking about, you know, where I go and everything. And he's like, have you ever played Australia? And I'm like, no, I would love to. He goes, call my agent. And I was like, huh? He's like, I'll call him, tell him about you, blah, blah, blah. So his agent's name is Artie Lang. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's the funniest thing it's in the world. different Artie Lang. <laughs> Thank God it's not I, the, I, I didn't Artie know Lang. There, I didn't know there were two Artie Lang. And, and to this Probably, day, no. no one has done more for my career like, I don't think anyone in Hollywood can do anything for you. You do it all yourself. Does this already have a nose? No, no, not. I mean, he has a, a normal nose. <laughs> yeah, he has nose. a real nose. Yeah, yeah, it's not a flattened. Um, that, that's, that's a whole other podcast. Um, <laughs> we could talk about that nose for days. Um, but this Artie literally has made my career. It, it, I, it's one of those things. All from just a call. Your buddy calling and saying, my "Hey, Eddie F's really funny." And I, him in I, I, li I don't like to take any credit for my career in Australia. I, uh -huh. I attribute it completely to this Artie Lang. Yeah, this guy. Um, yesterday, uh, my special aired in Australia on regular TV. Oh, that's pretty uh, sweet. Like on Channel Ten, which is, and their whole country's locked down, so like the whole country <sighs> saw it, and it's all because of him. Like everything is because of him. And I've never seen that ever anyone come close to that or do anything really like remotely, you know, like my, I, my manager here is great. And he, mm -hmm. he, he was the one who said, let's make a special. And let, so, but already just like get shit done. So I moved on or I went to Australia to do like you did a couple. Mm -hmm. He, I called the guy and he's like, yeah, I can get you some gigs. And he sends me an itinerary and they're like, $180 here, yeah, yeah. you know, like 120 bucks here. And it, at the time it was like way less than I was. I was at a n another level. So I was kind of, but you just I did it to go to Australia. I didn't take it as an insult. Cause I was like, I want to go to Australia. I want to yeah, surf. I want to like, yeah, they don't know me over there. Yeah. And I was like, I get it. And I just really wanted to see Australia. And so I went over, I stayed at a swingers house, which is a whole other story. And, uh, we, like, Did you participate? No, I, no. I uh, weird, like crazy shit. So it's a whole. Is there like a dumb Australian word for swinger? You know how they do everything yeah, they, stupid? Yeah, they, Swizzies or they, something? They add ease to the end of every, like yeah, an yeah. E sound to everything. <laughs> like your, your boardies, your, yeah, yeah, yeah. your, your uh, wetty, you know, like. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Swingy. Your, your rashy, Swingy, yeah. your rash. Everything's an E on the end. It's really weird. And guys' names, like I'd be Edo or Jono or Benno. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's just. They, Goofy. They, it, it's childish, <laughs> but, but um, uh, the I I get there and I do two like I think I did three weeks, and I just liked everyone. Everyone was like up for a good time, and everyone was nice, and everybody they were just so nice to me, and I was so happy to be there. And I think it was I had a good attitude, and I really loved it. That they were they were like, and he has a big company, A List Entertainment. They were like, "Do you want to come back? 
And I was like, I would love to come back. Yeah. And they're like, why don't you come back in six months? And I was like, okay. So I came back and I was there and they go, while I was there, he goes, hey, we're trying to get you on this TV show, Rove. And I was like, what's Rove? And he's like, it's like our David Letterman. And I was like, oh, okay. And then he was like, yeah, they didn't, you know, they passed on you. And I was like, okay. He's like, but I got you on this other show called The Glass House. And I don't know if you've ever met Will Anderson here, um, Australian comedian. Maybe briefly once, but I don't know him, yeah. He was the host of the show. He and this guy, Dave Hughes. He's like, hey, uh, we got you on The Glass House. And I just like didn't know what it was. I went on, it was a panel show and I got to talk like political jokes and and I just had a fun time, really fun time. And they go, uh, well, I'm like on the, sh my manager calls me agent over there, Artie, and he goes, well, I was on the show. He goes, I just got a call from Rove. They want you on, on like, well, you were on because the air. of that show. Yeah. He's like, yeah. well, you were on the air. I got a call saying we want him on Rove. So I go and I do Rove and I didn't realize they only had three channels at the time or four channels and the whole country watches it. So I do Rove and I do like a five minute set and they don't, they don't go over it like Eddie Brill would at Letterman. Like they don't. They, right, they like, let you do whatever you want. They're like, you're doing five minutes. Go. Here's your five minutes. Yeah. And after the show, I'm out with my friends there and we're like walking down the streets, like going to bars and people are yelling, Eddie Ift. And I'm like, <laughs> what just happened? You did John O. Carson. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was like doing Carson in yeah. the 80s. Yeah. Wow. And I was like, do people know who I am? And they're like, yeah, everybody watches that show. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to get so laid. <laughs> you know, I, was like, I was like, I got it. You met it. your wife. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> and then I did it. I, I think I was like the only guy that ever did it twice in a year. And, uh, you know, they started putting me on a lot of TV shows and stuff. And it's just, I love the country. I love the people. I, uh, well, I want, obviously, I, they I, love I, you. I would like to live there. Um, can't get in right now. but Because uh, of COVID. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, it's just, it was, it's one of those things where it's like, go where you're wanted and go away from where you're not wanted. Yeah. And <laughs> it's funny. I've done like, and I'm not a liberal or, or a conservative. I'm kind of so moderate. And I did a bit that went on. I never post bits on social media till just recently. Mm -hmm. I just finally broke down and like, hired the guy <laughs> and said, go ahead and do it. Um, and this, I put one bit on TikTok and it got to 1.9 million views. Good start. Hot but, start. But it got followed by all these psychotic rednecks. Oh, yeah. Like, it's happening to me right now. Psychos. The joke I posted yesterday. Oh, like, yeah. Dixie conservatives, like you're real, and all, like, psychotic, like, yes. like kind of swastika Confederate yep, flag yep, mixed yep. logos. Yep, that's, that's the audience. And I remember- <laughs> good crowds. Somebody goes- I don't think so. Somebody goes, dig in. And I'm like, no, that's what Owen Benjamin did. You know, like, that's- <laughs> Well, you could dig in without digging in like that. That yeah. doesn't mean start screaming the N-word and- I, getting kicked the, off the, of social the joke, media. The joke I was making fun of conservatives, but I was I said liberals, you're gonna lose the argument against conservatives when it comes to guns, because you're fighting with a bunch of people that have guns. Right. And I'm like, you know, I don't obviously you haven't done any history work or you realize this country was founded by people that came here with guns, killed the people that don't have guns, and then stole the country and wrote a constitution that said I'm keeping my fucking guns. Well they they lip sync it. You know, on that TikTok thing, mm -hmm. like there's thousands of people lip syncing my joke <laughs> and I'm. That's so cool. I didn't even see this. It was cool, but it was also like terrifying. <laughs> you don't always go where you want it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and no, and I always. thought I thought if I could sell like 5000 seats a night, like Larry, the cable guy to these places, I still wouldn't do it. No. Damn. Unless you did like a Inglorious Bastards. Yeah. <laughs> you just burn the building that's down. A, that's, a, that's, a, that's a genius idea. <laughs> you sell out 5,000, yeah. you just do super yeah. liberal material. <laughs> yeah. Well, I used to kind of do yeah. stuff like that. But, uh, it's fun. but, you know, I would go to like the most, and I would do it both ways. I'd go to the most conservative area and do liberal jokes because I can twist all my jokes. You know, or Stuart go, Huff? Stuart Southern Huff. comedian. He's been around forever. He's super funny, but that's what he does. Is he part of the uh, the uh, the um, no no liberal rednecks? No no, okay. but he's he's before them. He's okay, been around for a long time. But he he strictly works redneck rooms. Super lefty, kills with him. He's unbelievable. Yeah, I just I I had a joke years ago about uh, about Muslims, and I could I saw it work both ways, where liberals would be laughing at like the irony of it, and then conservatives would laugh at like. Uh, he said Muhammad, you know, like, <laughs> and, and so I like to almost like switch it 
but it's more fun to throw it in their face now. Mm -hmm. Like I like to go the opposite of them. And that would probably be the biggest reason like for my career, never. I think it. most audiences, most people get jokes either way, as long as they're funny. You just have the extremes on both sides sure. that'll get mad. So it's like you could do that and you'd be fine. Yeah, you're going to have the extremes no matter what. Like we have this, I call them the vocal minority. Yeah. And the vocal minority, real, we used to just tell them to shut up. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, we all focus on them now. Mm -hmm. Like if I hear the, the internet, the squad one more time, it's like, who cares? Yeah, yeah. They're like, there's like four of them. There's 455 congressmen, and you always focus on these yeah, four. That they're obsessed on first term Congress people. Yeah, yeah. First term. Yeah, that like have no ability to yeah, do anything, yeah. and it's like, yeah, shut up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just shut. I, I, we had them in college. We had people like that. They protest, and you're like, oh, yeah, have fun protesting. But and now they have a louder it. voice because in college you could walk away, and now they're tweeting at Eddie Ift, at yeah. whoever. I had it happen to me. They came after the liberals came after me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, guys, you're like, you know, like I'm on your side. It was like anti-Trump stuff. Mm -hmm. I got in a fight with Stormy Daniels on uh, on Twitter. I just posted headliner something. headlining comedian Stor Stormy mm -hmm. Daniels. Yeah, that's what I yeah. got in a fight with her. But. Yeah, and uh, I didn't even care. I yeah. just it was one of these things. I woke up, I read a couple tweets, and I'm like, oh, I'll say this, and I thought nothing of it. And then the next thing I woke up, I was in Australia at the time, and one of my friends from America called me. He's like, what do you do? You're trending. And I'm like, what? He's like, oh, my God. And he goes, it's not good. <laughs> and and Wait, I, What did you say to her? So I didn't even hear about this. She was saying people were – a lot of comedians were saying, like, hey, stay out of the comedy clubs. You know, like, you don't belong right. there, blah, blah, blah. And she said – all I read was her statement where she said – I've been on 40 year old virgin. I worked with the groundlings. I was on SNL. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm qualified to work a stand up comedy club. And I was like, that doesn't, those are different things. Like mm -hmm. comedy is like jazz. And so that's what I wrote back. Like I said something like, I'm sure you can play Mary had a little lamb on the piano. That doesn't mean you should be headlining the blue note. <laughs> and I said, and uh, you know, I can slide down the pole at my kid's playground but that doesn't mean I should be headlining Experiment Rhino. <laughs> and I Slut said, shaming or yeah. something. And I said, for all our sake, this is where I went wrong. Stay in your lane. Mm. And it got twisted to white man yep. tells woman to stay in her lane. Damn. And so I look and a lot of the people coming after me were journalists and they were like writing to me. And I feel like they were wielding their power of like, I have a magazine or, a, you know, internet space behind me that I'm going to smash you online because if you come at me, I'll cry. So then I started, I, I was being like funny about it at that point then. Yeah. I like, leaned in. Yeah. And I, cause that's what I always do. And I'm like, what are you going to do to me? And I'm like, really, what are you going to do? You're going to forget about this in two days. So I'm going to get you as angry as I possibly can. <laughs> so then they started like, I started getting calls from like variety, Hollywood reporter, blah, blah, blah. And my manager's just like, don't pick up the, like, don't take the calls. Don't, don't, don't. And I've had that a few times, like Louis CK came back to comedy. Eddie, if you want to, you want to, you want to, you know, comment on this. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, I do. But I don't want you to, and all your friends to destroy my life because mm -hmm. I will comment. So I usually do kind of lay low. Yeah, just because I know they're just they're just trying to be contentious and they're yeah. just yeah they're they're not looking out for your best interest. Not at all. <laughs> when someone says, "Hey, what do you think about Louis C.K. coming yeah, they're, out?" They're just using. It. Yeah, yeah. And they're not doing it to promote you. I used to think it was kind of funny, and I used to tell my promoter in Australia when this because it happened to me a couple times in Australia. I'd be like, "Yeah, let's." This will get good. You know, this is the business we're in. So I, I was like, you know, let's, let's terrorize. Let's have fun with this. And my promoter like, yeah. in Australia, I got in trouble for something. And uh, she goes. Like a separate Australian incident happened. Yeah, oh, yeah. And she goes, I was. It seemed, I didn't realize you were such a troublemaker. She goes, let's, let's, let's. Uh, she goes, or I was like, let's do it. Let's get. And she goes, no, no, no. She's like, all it takes is one person in immigration to see your thing come across and go, oh, this is that asshole that blah, blah, blah. And then you're not coming to Australia ever again. Good and point. she's like, 
just don't rock the boat. And I was like, what about, you know, like Tracy Morgan would come and, you know, say something controversial and then sell out like 10,000 seats. But Tracy Morgan never went back. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. she's like, you have a good career here. And somehow Tracy Morgan can get away with more than you can. Sure, <laughs> sure. I, the, the funny thing is I, I did a whole show called What Women Don't Want to Hear. And it was my festival show and I did an hour long show and it was just, it was pretty funny, but it was just basically saying men are pieces of shit and that lower your expectations. Like mm-hmm. we're animals. That's all we are. We're animals. We want to eat and we want to have sex and, and you expect more of us. And then when we don't do it, that was the whole premise of the show. The two biggest newspapers in the country came to my show the first night and both gave me a one star review. In Australia? Yeah. And oh yeah, and I was in a big. Is that the festival in? Um, that's the Melbourne comedy. Yeah, Melbourne. And, and yeah. I was in a big like, uh, I think it was like five. No, no I was in a thousand seat venue, so it was like I got to sell a thousand seats for twenty nine nights. Mm. And, with one with two one star reviews, not happening. And so I said to my promoter, "Let's lean in. Let's let's go." You know, she was like, "No, no, 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 no," and I was like. I wanted to change all my posters and have them say critics agree if is a star (laughs) (laughs) and and just put that on every poster. And then I said we should I ended up because I disagreed with my promoter so much. I ended up putting it on my DVD. It's the what the woman says about me is the quote on the back. And she's like saying that I should be deported and that I'm (laughs) the filth of the earth and blah, blah, blah. And I have it like uh, it's, it's on my DVD as like the quote. And I kind of liked it when the first review came out. I was like laughing hysterically. Really? Like, you didn't take it? Even the first one you weren't not, for a moment like, oh, okay, so no. the, the woman that did the review was this like enormous cross-eyed lesbian feminist. <laughs> and I was just like, of course she's going to hate me. Yeah. And so I was kind of like, ha, ha, ha. And uh, she... Then I look at the next paper. Somebody's like, hey, did you see the review in the paper? I'm like, yeah, blah, blah, blah. That that bitch hates me. You know, and they're like, no, the the, the dude that wrote it. And I'm like, there's another one. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, yeah, the Herald Sun. And I'm like, oh, I got to go to the store right now and get a newspaper. Oh, I read it. No. And I was like, Found out later the two of them came together. Oh, that makes sense. Sat next to each other. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. coffee afterwards amped Ooh. each other up she in fact i read i like i read her blog or something because i was going to go to war with her because i kind of found it fun and i read in her blog she goes um she's like i'm going to see eddie ifs uh what women don't want to hear she goes i can't wait to destroy him before she so went, she went in show, with an mo yeah real good journalist there yeah real yeah. open-minded comedy but, reviewer but to, to be honest it's like i find that kind of stuff fun when so. was this would have been like 20, 2012, maybe okay, 2013. Decent amount of time ago. Maybe 2014. Nah, yeah, I don't know. I don't remember. Everything's a blur. It's been so long. The rise and fall, both America and Australia. Yeah. Yeah. They, <laughs> and it did, you know, it's funny. My career did go away a bit in Australia. After because that. of that? I think it just, I stopped. I, I started having trouble getting on television. I think there were other reasons. But, uh, now it's like I'm getting back on. And I just think that happens to everybody. You go in waves. Yeah. You know, you're hot ebbs and, and flows. You're cold. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we want to move there. So it's just. Is it easy to move there? Because you're both American. She so. almost had residency. And I had her give it up to move to America. Damn. So it would be easy for me to get it. Um, I think it would be getting the family. It would be another story. And it would be hard. But. It's just to us, it's a better life. Australia us. is so much better. It's America 2.0. Yeah. It's cleaner. Yeah. The people are more chill. Everyone has more money. Yeah. It's it's just a higher level people, of living. Yeah, people at McDonald's make like $20 an hour. Yeah, it's and, a much higher living standard. They take long vacations yes. and they go spend yeah. tons of money there. They just got it hooked up. Well, they only have 20 million people in a country as big as the United States. Yeah. So it's, it's uh, I just felt a lot. Yeah, I, I hope my dog is not like chewing wires or anything over there. It's a risk. The dog's crazy. So uh, you surf as well. Yeah. You're not, a big surfer. Not, I want to well. talk about that. You know, who's a better comedian surfer? Who's better? You or Lachlan? Uh, I would say Lachlan's got me edged out now. Yeah. 
because what about uh chad chad kroger chad uh, jt you know i only surfed with him once and i didn't really get to see him he sat on the inside so i didn't see his like abilities lachlan goes i used to surf every day and then i had kids and then i had a, i had a kid then i had a second kid and so i think i was better than lachlan but i think lachlan surfs more and lachlan also charges like he's not afraid of big waves at all like there'll be a big wave coming and it just looks like it's not like perfect like you know, like I'm in the right place for anything. I'm like, uh, I'll wait. I'm pass on. And Lachlan will just charge. But um, Fearless. Ta Tosh is That's pretty, half of it. Tosh is pretty good. Really? Yeah. Tosh is pretty good. Um, and Tosh was really good when I started. And he was a real dick about it. <laughs> like a super dick about it. Um, like I would ask him because I, I loved it. Have you ever been in a fight out in the water? Oh, yeah. A territory fight. Not a fist fight, but close. So you never had your head or you've never dunked someone's head underwater? Out of, I, told a out guy, of I told a guy to shut the fuck up one day. This this kid, he screamed at me for almost paddling into his wave, which I didn't. Mm -hmm. And there's all this etiquette and everything. So he paddles back out and he's yelling. And he's like a young kid. You know, it looks like he's like 18 years old or something. He's screaming at me. And I just don't like to be yelled at. Never have. No one does. Never have done well with it, though. Like, I've, it's gotten me thrown out of school and stuff like that. And so I just paddle over to him, and I paddle the nose of my board over the nose of his board. So I'm, like, face to face with him. And I, and it's, like, intimidating because no one ever really does it. And I go, shut the fuck up. You're ruining everyone's day. And it scared him because I guess no one's ever, like, challenged this kid. It's up in Malibu. He's, like, an entitled little rich kid. And I'm... I'm, I just keep going, shut the fuck up. And I didn't threaten him, but he picked up his board because I guess I was giving an air of like aggressiveness. Yeah. So he picked up his board to put it between me and him so that I couldn't hit him. Uh -huh. And the wind caught it and it hit him in the face. <laughs> so then he goes, you hit me. You hit me. And I'm like, I didn't hit you. He's like, you hit me. You hit me. That God hit you. And yeah, pretty much. That's what happened. God, God just bitch slap you, you yeah. fucking. Yeah. Um, so then he goes and starts to paddle out to like the lifeguards. And I'm watching, I'm watching. I'm like, is this kid going to tell on me? Real like, is, tough guy. is this really about to happen? Yeah. You're about to be tattled on. And I'm like, and then I'm like, what are they going to do? I didn't, I didn't hit him. Like, and then I just start thinking about it. I'm like, it's his word against mine. Like, does the police get involved in this? Like, what happens? And I was like, I'd rather just avoid this. So I just dad probably runs Paramount. Too. Yeah, yeah uh, you never know up there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I just paddled down. Like, I don't, you wouldn't understand, but there's like three points to the. Yeah, to you the went way. to a different part of the beach. I, I basically went way far down the beach. Yeah, climbed, got out of the water, and walked around like up the road to where <laughs> I was parked and left, because I was like. Yeah, Good just, beginning of the story. You pussing out at the end, though. Yeah, but no. it was funny. I asked my buddy who's a lifeguard. I was like, hey, uh, could you have done anything? He goes, well, y you threatened him. That's assault. I go, I didn't threaten him. I told I him said, to shut, shut the, the fuck, fuck up. up. Yeah. And he's like, well, were you aggressive? And I go, I mean, that's, uh, yeah. what country do we live in? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like. Yeah, I was aggressive. What about, would this be a good insult to someone swimming out at the surf if you said, hey, you swim like a water polo player? Um, or would that be a compliment? That'd be a compliment because they're good. They're good swimmers. They're like the best swimmers in the world. Yeah, and they're the toughest. Is it's there? A, it's is, a. It's a that those like a lot of the Navy SEALs are water polo players. Oh, I didn't know that. That's yeah, that's uh, a lot of farmers and a lot of water polo players become Navy SEALs. Yeah, I wonder why farmers. They're just they're, used to being they're out so labor. tough, and yeah. so they're all the guys. I, I I have a lot of Navy SEALs on my podcast uh, wadcast that I do, and um. They just say shit like their dad would like kick him out of their house when like the sun would come up and he's like, don't come in until the sun goes down and go, you know, knock all these fence posts in. And, you know, like it was There's just hard, hard, hard work, work yeah. all day long that they can endure it. A lot of people look at me and think that I was in the Navy. Seals, everyone, I wasn't. everyone I've ever talked to when I say your name, they go. I think he was in the Navy SEALs. Isn't he a Navy SEAL? Did he kill Osama? Is that is that Ari? I get, it's Osama? a confusing. It's confusing, but I, it wasn't. I met a dude in Vegas once <laughs> at a porn convention. You know the you, AVNs. What were you doing there? I, uh, April. A, no, I wanted to host it. Okay. They always like would talk to me about hosting it, and yeah. then never gave it to me. Um, 
April Macy was hosting it. Okay. And I'm doing shows at like, I think it was at Brad Garrett's or something. Yeah. And April messages me and she's like, hey, um, you need to get the fuck over here right now. This is hilarious. So she's like, I got a ticket for you and your buddy or whatever. So we go over and I'm just laughing. I mean, it's like prom, but everybody's dressed like they're at a black prom. You know, like mm-hmm. they're, the, they're the fanciest outfits you've ever seen. But like, there's no style. It's like, is is there tinfoil in that dress? You know, like they're wearing the weirdest shit. Mm-hmm. And they're having the best time of their life. Like this is the big, and yeah, I probably I, all hook up. Yeah. And I just think it's like, they love the attention and, and they strive for that. So and this is where they get attention without a lot of pain. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 And so I think this is like, they get to be celebrated and yeah, they really yeah. like it, but I'm just having fun walking around, getting my picture taken with like, if you look at my Twitter profile, there's a woman there with the biggest boobs I've ever seen in my entire life. And I was like, can I get my picture with you? And I've posted that as my Twitter profile. And if you Google Eddie F. wife, she comes up <laughs> all the time. So, so, um, so how's go, your wife feel about that? She, my wife could care less about yeah. anything I do. Um, so I see this guy in full military regal and I go up to him and I'm like, what porno were you in? He's like, dude, I passed out on the, uh, at the pool. And I blacked out. And the next thing I know, I was here. And he's like, I'm like, are you really? He's like, yeah, I'm a fucking Marine. And I was like, not for long, dude. Like, they find out you're here in full dress military. Yeah. And he was one of the funniest guys I've ever met. So I'm like, I'm hanging with you. So we were going to the bar, getting drinks and everything. And I would just walk up to porn stars. I'm like, you know who this is? This guy shot Osama bin Laden. <laughs> like, this is the guy who killed him. I was like, you need to fuck him for our country. You need to fuck. This guy d- killed Osama for so you. So he had an orgy that night because of you. So this guy was just, we were having the best time. And I took him later that night. We did my podcast at some Irish bar in Vegas that was set up. And my co-host, who's the biggest idiot in the world, we're all backstage. We're about to bring this guy. He's going to be our guest. Mm-hmm. The guy who, and we're going to tell them he's the guy that killed this <laughs> <Osama>. guy. <laughs> and uh, my sidekick, Jason, who's the biggest idiot in the world, ends up getting in a fight with him backstage. Like, uh, like a- A real fight. A fight. Why? But it gets broken up. I forget what it was about, but it gets broken up. They both come on stage and neither will talk. <laughs> And we're doing a live podcast in front of a live audience. And they're like, they're mad at each other. Oh, my god! <laughs> yeah, so it got ruined. Now I want to know what the fight was about. I forget everything. Jason. Good did, old Jason. Did you what? know Jason? No. What's he doing now? Jason was my sidekick for like 10 years. Maybe. Was he? Uh, talking shit. He wasn't on when I did the the bingo bus. At the You'd know him. Everybody knew him. Yeah. yeah. Like when we used to do talking shit, he... When Jim Jeffries and I did it, the funny thing was all we did was torture him. We were going to name the show Bullies <laughs> because all we did was bully this guy around. And I mean, in bad ways, like pranks. Like we got him a hooker once, told him it was like we put him on Match.com and told him he had a date. But we actually <laughs> hired a hooker. Like we that's the kind of stuff we did on a did daily basis. No, he went to lunch with her. He comes back. He tells us we owe her $180. He's screaming at us. And we're like. He's like, I didn't know she was a hooker. She wants money now. What the fuck is wrong with you guys? You guys set me on a <laughs> date Was she in on the joke we're, at all or no, no? No, we're in an alley in Venice and everybody's yelling. He's like, I, you need to go. I'm like, I don't have the money. He's like, you need to go to a bank machine right now. You need to pay this girl. Please this tell bullshit. me you filmed this. So we were like, why didn't you have sex with her? He's like, she didn't want to have sex. She, she liked, we're going to be friends. We're like, you took a hooker to the friend zone. Like, who does that? That's how bad, like, she didn't want to have sex with you. So you're now friends with a hooker. So we- That you owe money to as well. We abused him so badly, but it was like, Jim and I lived for it. And we'd bring big guests like Mark Maron or whoever, Tiffany Haddish. They'd be on our podcast and we wouldn't even talk to them. We would talk to Jason. And that was like, with Jason. it was a very well-known thing. People would say, hey, it was like doing Jim and Eddie's podcast. And they're like, they, they just talk, talk to, to this, this fat homeless guy that lives on their couch. <laughs> <laughs> because he was just so funny. Is there anything in your life that you have a problem with? Anything I could help you with in your life? This is a weird, issues? weird, weird question. 
Is this part of your podcast? Yeah, it's a segment. Unlicensed therapy. Oh, I didn't even understand that's what the show was. I don't. I didn't warn you. Oh, you just said come do my podcast. Yeah, yeah. Um, Tricked you. Eh, I don't give a shit. I'll talk to anyone. <laughs> you know, it's. I was driving here and I was like all excited because I just wanted to get away from my wife and kids. <laughs> Perfect. And I was like, <laughs> I will do anyone's podcast mm-hmm. at this point. Like I like you, but you know, I used to kind of be very discerning about like. It just got to the point where I have kids and it's hard to get away. Sure. I can only do so many things. And it, and now I'm like, if there was a guy down the street who's like, I have two listeners, I'd be like, what time do you need me? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you need more hobbies to yeah. get away. I have a million. I'm not well, allowed yeah, yeah. to do those. Oh, right, right. Like I get, Unless I got, it pays, you can't do it. it? Be yet, responsible. Yesterday, I had, a do- I had a doctor's appointment. My wife has a doctor's appointment for the kid. So I go to mine like... I'm on my way back from Santa Monica. She's on her way to Santa Monica for the doctor's appointment. I'm like, I'm going to go surf. By the time I get home, she'll be home. And she won't even know I surfed or even it won't matter because I. And I get back to the car from surfing and my phone has like 32 messages. And I'm just like, oh, fuck, they're home. <laughs> and she's Where like, are you? Where are you? And I was like, oh, God damn it. But so, you got to surf. Yeah. Yeah, whatever. I know, but you just hear it then. Yeah. Then yeah. you get back and they, you feel guilty for surfing. Yeah. yeah. And they make you yeah. feel like, oh, how was surfing? Yeah. I was taking the kids to the doctors. Yeah, yeah. How was that? The whole time I'm out there, that is, it, it's no longer fun unless I've, I tell people I had kids so that I'd have friends. <laughs> and so I'm also trying to brainwash my kids into liking all my hobbies. Yep. So Smart. that I can go do them and they're like, I'm coming with you, dad. And my wife's like, oh, that's awesome. You're just taking the kids. <laughs> like my son's two and he's obsessed with the skate park. And so oh, I'm perfect. like, cool, I'll go to the skate park and I'll skate. But like I'm watching him the whole time. It's Now it's like yeah, I, I got to get them going. My daughter skiing wise is like really good to the point where I can. And she's six to the point where I can be like, have fun. Like, see ya. Go. Yeah, I was going to say, you could just sign them up for skiing. You could just sign them up for ski school. Yeah. And be like, yeah, I'm taking them skiing. They're at ski school. You're skiing. Well, that's I'm going to put her in a race program. She's that good. And I'm going to put her in a race program and just go, like, drop her off. You'd have to move, though, right? Uh, I mean, we're going to have to, like, find a way. You know, Sean White is from San Diego. Is he? And he's the best snowboarder of all time. That's true. Yeah. So maybe you don't have to move. No, snowboarding's different. Snowboarding, Snowboarding is like skating. And I feel like skating and surfing... And if you're good on a board, you can be good at all the boards. But skiing is a different animal completely. What's your best sport? I went to college for uh, running hurdles. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't have gotten into college if it wasn't. What school? University of Pittsburgh. Sick. Yeah, Division One. Like that's like a private school, isn't it? No, I mean it's public private, but it's like we were at the time. We had the gold medal winner. I was going to say, did you do you watch the hurdles in the Olympics now yeah. because you were good at it? Yeah, it's funny. I always try to see where I'd be in the... So I could have never made it to the Olympics. I had I ran Olympic qualifying time. But you technically could call, qualify, but there's people who are better than the qualifying way, time. A lot of guys. Yeah. A ton. If I lived in like Equatorial Guinea, <laughs> I, could, I could maybe make the Olympics. I'd, I might move just for that. If I had known about it, like I might have like <laughs> you done, might have done it. I didn't understand. You know, I yeah. just realized there's like 200 guys. I ahead still of me. think about that. I think about what sport could I pick up at age 31 as an American. There's got to be some weird niche air rifle sport or something curling. like that. The curling. Always curling, yeah, some some table tennis. I don't know what it is, but I watch. I'm like, if I picked up and dedicated my life for the next three years. Could I qualify? Could I make it to the And the answer is no. None of them? Because, no, because there are guys that, that's what that have landed. dedicated their whole life to it that are 30 years ahead of you. Yeah. Like, I know a guy that did, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, what's the thing where you're losing, but you're on your stomach and you're going head first? Skeleton. Skeleton. Yeah. I know a guy that did that. And if you know this guy, you'd be like, he's the most intense individual ever. <laughs> Like he's a top CrossFitter and he didn't make it to the top of CrossFit, but he, he was like close to the top in skeleton. He was close to the top of skeleton, but like didn't make the Olympic team. And he was like fucking and he was incredible and juiced yeah. and you know, like, 
You're saying if that guy couldn't do it. Yeah, it's yeah, like it's, and, it's and, and cuz I was always like well, how many skeleton teams were there in high school? Yeah. Right. You know, I've never, never heard of any. That's no, the thing. I've never met sports. a person. But what There's happens a... in those sports, like I have a bunch of guys trying out. Uh, my Aussie friends are all trying out for the Aussie bobsled team. And they're CrossFitters. They came and found them. They're like, they've got the power. They've got the speed. They've got the this. They've got the that. So they've moved them into it. So you just look at them physically compared to your, and you're like, I'm not in the same category as these guys. And they've already way more advanced and have the skills. I still think I could curl with the best of them. I don't know. It looks so hard. What are you talking about? The sweeping? No, I, I could be the pusher, though. I don't know. That just looks like something like darts or golf. Yeah, I feel like I could be get pretty good at darts. Too. I see the guys holding the air rifle. <laughs> darts is so hard. And they're just nerds. The guys with the air. Did you watch the, oh, the skiing shooting one? That's, they, that's no, really that's sure hard. That stuff. No, yeah, skiing shooting sounds biathlon. Tough. Yeah, yeah. No, there's guys who just shoot an air rifle, not even a real gun. It's like a toy gun, at a target, and it's an Olympic sport. Or was this year? And yeah, I watched it's a it, carnival and they, game. Yeah, and they were all like dweebs, and I'm like, I could, I could train and beat these dweebs. You'd have to start. You, you'd have to put in like ten years. Yeah, you're right. And who wants to do that? <laughs> like, like when you win that, you win the gold medal at that, and nobody goes. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't uh, impress anybody. I had a plan this year for the Olympics that I didn't do. I was going to delete all my Instagram posts, buy an Olympic outfit, take pictures of me at, like, a park doing random sports that you can't even identify to what sport it is, and then change my bio to Olympian and just make myself look like an Olympian just on Instagram. Olympian would be your body like, maybe like tokyo that's Olympian your or, name or, olympian no my name would still be ari but the instead of comedian it would say athlete olympian. and then i'd say 2021 tokyo olympics and then just pictures of me in olympic uniform doing random things these are the things i think about all the time that i don't execute yeah Dude, there was do a you have that problem too i usually do i didn't execute this one but you usually do i, I like guys execute. that execute yeah, yeah, that's I my problem execute. i'm full of ideas not execution mm -hmm. It's tough because you got to wake up at a reasonable time. And the hard part is you got to get someone else to help you execute these. Like for this, I need a photographer to follow me around town in an Olympic outfit. Right. So that's now it's easy. asking for a that's favor. Craigslist right there. That's easy. <laughs> yeah. That's easy. Yeah. That's easy. That, <laughs> like you just you just gave me the the easiest barrier right there. And, and you, you already told me that one was hard for you. I'm like, you're never going to get this. If that's hard for you. But yeah. I could still do it even though the Olympics is over maybe. Dude, I'll tell you what's like better that. than gold medal. There is a uh, Division One pole vaulter went viral. The he, hot girl? Oh, no. No, no, he, not the hot girl. Yeah. But he, he was pole vaulting, and he was in the top. He was, like, going to place. He was going over the – He his body cleared his dick. Dick, I saw knocked, that. That's better than a gold medal. Yeah. To me. Oh, if you're viral yeah. because For your hog a, knocked a fucking yeah. pole off. That's yeah. badass. That's yeah. badass. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's – a gold medal that's can the, suck my dick. That's the only guy in the world that wishes he had a smaller dick. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> he was like, oh, God, if only – what if you just made yourself doing sports where your dick got in the way and that was your whole Instagram page? Yeah, for sure. Be pretty Called good. like Dick Too Big. Dick Too Big. Yeah. <laughs> At Dick Too Big. So what? nothing in your life I could help you with? Um, I guess yeah, getting away. Maybe my cleathrophobia. That's your scared of elevators? Yeah. And that's I'm, real? You don't say that as no, a, no, to no. be I, a quirky I, I, guy? No, I get panic attacks. Uh, like, I've ridden some elevators my mom was in the hospital uh, and I had to ride a couple elevators to get to, to go her. Visitor. And it was just, that was kind Are of. Are you just in the back kind of like shaking a little bit of nerve? Do you have to close your it's, eyes? It's and more about, go? it's more about the opening and closing of the door. Like when the door, when we get to the floor, I hate the elevators that you don't know they're not moving. You know, when you're in an elevator yes. and I like, can't feel it moving. Cause I think I'm stuck then. Have you ever been stuck? Um, that created this fear? So they think that this comes from falling in a pool. Claustrophobia is caused by falling in a pool, which I did as a kid. Like and almost drowning or yeah. just? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, I might have had a breakthrough recently. Um, when I was a kid, I have like four older cousins and then all their buddies. And we were always together at the pool and everything. And I remember not wanting to go in the pool with them because they would like wrestle you down and you'd like almost drown. Yeah. And they were dicks. They were all fucking dicks. Yeah. And and you weren't a strong swimmer. No, I, I just not. But they, it, it they is were, interesting that you surf now. They were all older than me. Yeah. So they could like hold you under and do whatever they. 
And, um, and I remember just going there in the pool. I'm not going in the pool. Like they would ruin my day at the pool. I'm like, I can't go in the pool now. They're in there mm -hmm. or I'd be in the pool. I'd see them. I'd get out of the pool. Just pretend like, Oh, I gotta go get something to eat now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I was at the pool where I grew up. I just had to go home for a while and I'm at the pool. I've got my kids with me and my little boy who's two. I've got him in his floaties and I'm throwing him up in the air and catching him. And one of my older cousins comes over to us and he goes, let me throw him. Let me throw him. And he's an idiot. And I go, no. And he goes, let me throw him. I'm like, no, I, I'm not like trusting you with my child. And I didn't say that, but he just go, 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 give him to me, give him to me. And I went, no, no. And he goes to like grab at oh my, my kid and then Jesus. does this like kind of jokey, kind of serious, like thrash with his body, like a whale would, you know, like into the pool. And it just brought me back to him doing it to me, mm -hmm. you know, like 30, 40 years ago. And I'm like, oh, my God, this fucking dick was just about to do. I'm to scared my, elevators because of you. I, I was like, you're just about to do this to my two year old. What you did to me and I'm all fucked up from it. And and I was like, I was like, no, asshole, not my kid. You're not going to mess with my kid. Yeah. But but I was just like, you're not throwing my kid in the air. You're not like I'm not letting you near him. I feel like reaching for your kid is grounds for murder. Yeah. Anyone yeah. that wants I mean, your like, kid that bad has got issues. Yeah. Well, he, we know this guy has issues. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, uh, you know, it was weird. <laughs> I don't Give me your that. kid. Give me your kid. I don't like to, It's so funny. Podcasts now, because there's so many, like, people that like to, like, get you. Scour right? them for cancel. Yeah. Totally. That I worry about anytime someone mentions me on a podcast, I get a tweet or a message the next day that's like, hey, you were on Greg Fitzsimmons. They were talking about you, blah, 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 blah. You know, and so it, it's so quickly, like, I got to be careful what I say about it, I used to think it was like, nobody cares, nobody listens, blah, blah, now blah. Now they do. I just got a recent comment that was mad at me because I'm an anti-vaxxer and because they said I was mildly homophobic. But it's like, for all they know, I'm gay. How could you call me mildly homophobic? You got my comment? <laughs> <laughs> I know homophobic gay people, though. I definitely do. Really? Yeah, absolutely. That are um, they're kind of weirdly like anti-gay, but they are gay. I mean, isn't that like most like in 90s Republican senators? Yeah. yeah. Isn't that what they <laughs> all, all, the, all the ones that are glory holes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I do truly believe that, too. I believe that all those guys are closeted. Absolutely. The guys who, yeah. who do the gay conversion camps, are the guy who started that is, is now married to a man, lives in Texas. Yeah, that's. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's that's the wide stance. Remember that when they used to the Republican senators used to touch interns feet under the stall to signal it's time to suck my dick. Uh, male interns. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I We're was in the an, wrong. Biz. I was an intern for a Republican senator. <laughs> Whoa. Is that in a brass? Yep. Who can you say? Arlen Specter. He's dead now. Was he nice? No, he's a douche. Was They're he all Pennsylvania? 90% of those guys are fucking assholes. Are they kind of like people who want to become actors? Yes. They're, they're <laughs> celebrities with no charisma, so they go to yeah. it's politics. An, it's an, it's all egomaniacal. Or it's people that like, I forget what they make now, like 155000 a year or something. It's like guys that could never make that money. And all of a sudden so they, they get two million lobby fees. Yeah, there. then they get a job afterwards that leads. So, so it's we, either for money or for attention. Yeah. What it's, was your job though? What did you do? I like, was I was just an intern and like uh, coffee and stuff. No, you were like mailroom. You uh, you read a lot of letters. Letters come in. They want you to either like, you know, like dedicate a flag or something, or they, you raise these flags above the Capitol building for someone that died, and or you uh, and you can sign the letters. My joke used to be that. There's a pen called the auto pen and it has a pedal and you just put the paper underneath the pedal and then you sign the senator's name. It goes, mm, it's like a robotic arm and you hit a pedal and uh, like they don't. That's pretty cool. They, they, they don't sign it. And it's it, it literally holds a pen and puts, it does their signature. Like so he used his blue felt pens and it would go down nah, 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 and does their signature. I want to buy one of and those just I, for fun. And I said, you should see my letter of recommendation, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> which I did do. I typed out, because I, I would write letters a lot of times and they'd have to be approved. And then they'd be like, okay, boom, go sign it, send it out. 
So I wrote this letter that was like my letter of recommendation for our inspector. And it circulated all over the office. They all thought it was fucking <laughs> hilarious <laughs> until it got to the chief of staff. And now I lost my internship. That's exactly what happened. They you know, it's funny. I'm looking him up right now. Arlen Specter was a Democrat until 1965 and then switched to Republican. Then switched back. What happened in 1965? The Civil Rights Act. <laughs> so he's, so he's I'm a, imagining a racist. that had something to do with this. He was, he was pretty liberal. I think he, from what I understand of him, he, he was the silver bullet theory guy with Kennedy. That's or, why I know his name. Or the single bullet. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, single yeah, bullet yeah, theory. Yeah, yeah. He was a conspiracy theorist. He or, just no, he was the one saying it was one bullet. That's it. The opposite. Yeah. yeah he's, he's, oh, he was the he, one saying. Um, so he planned it. Pretty much, he killed. Probably, he probably. killed Kennedy. Wow. He was one of the shooters. He uh, he became a Republican. Oh. Ag- or wait, he became a Democrat again. He did. It says in two thousand nine, he switched back. So wow. you know what that was? Couldn't make up his mind. No. Show was, a little loyalty, guy. It was just to get elected. He yep. like looked at like where is best possibility of staying in office. Yeah, Obama they're, won Pennsylvania. Let me switch over. They're just pieces of shit. They're yeah, the yeah. worst people. <laughs> and we need to stop paying attention to them. You've also been around long enough where you've seen so many different waves of comedy. Like you said, like the Luna Lounge people yeah. coming in. Now the tough social crowd. media, yeah. tough crowd, podcast. You've seen people make it from so many weird different ways. And the funny thing about that is like you see them and I don't want to name names, but you see them riding it, the wave and being like such assholes. And you're like, dude, this doesn't last long. And it can, you can have the rug pulled out from under you so quickly and you will regret. My, my manager says it all the time. Careful who you kick on the way up. They kick you twice as hard on the way down. Maria Bamford calls it showbiz induced schizophrenia. <laughs> She talks about it a lot where she'll be like, you know, she'll go and be like, oh, I just hung out with my friend. They're buzzing. Things are going well for them. And it's like a mania that like just makes you insane. And yeah. then you're just slammed right back into the ground. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. so I've tried to stay level no matter what. Like, mm-hmm. like never get too excited. Never get too upset because, you know, like my thing is I, I joke about it all the time, but. People, whenever they say, hey, you're talented, I go, no, I'm not talented. I have a disability. Like anyone in this business, <laughs> yeah. Ev- yeah. everyone in this business is disabled. Mm-hmm. And the people, the most successful people I know are usually the most disabled. Uh-huh. Like like they have a mental disability. They're fucking crazy. <laughs> and so I think uh, comics are just such fuck ups. Mm-hmm. And so... And so what happens is when they get that success that they want so badly, that it's just, it's everything that they completely strive for and it's all they care about and they don't give a fuck about anyone else. And they, there are some really good people and treat sure. people really, really, really well. But sometimes on the other end of that, there's people getting shit on. And I've seen that a lot too, where people are like, he's the best guy in the whole world. And I'm like, really? Talk to his secretary, you know, like, <laughs> or talk to, so, it's, I, I forget why we were talking about this, but um, we were just talking about your book you wanted to put out, no. and then we moved into the uh, the people becoming dicks when they succeed. <laughs> we got we got sidetracked from something else though. I think it was you and your vaccinations, or um, yeah, everyone's heard my vax talk yeah. on this podcast. So you publicly come out and say you're anti-vax on this podcast. I've I've made mention to. I'm not listen. I'm anti-vax for me. I'm not anti-vax. I think everyone should do whatever they want. I think the That's vaccine the is just so fucking easy to get. And it's it just is such a precaution that it's like, and if you believe any of I've, I've had so many fucking needles put in me for typhoid fever. Cause I've been to so many weird countries, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yellow fever, typhoid fever, hepatitis, all these things. It's just like, when I was in the military, I got orders to Iraq and then they were canceled, but I got all the Iraq vaccines yeah. that you get. And I, it, Fucked me up. Yeah, I got fucked up from yellow fever. Uh, yeah. Just, just not, just a little fluey that night. That was it. I uh, microdosed yeah. on mushrooms the other day, and I was fucked up from it. You're a sober guy, so I imagine your system. Yeah, I was, seriously, I took one system. little mushroom pill. They're like, it's just a microdose. You're fine. The whole night, I was like, I'm tripping on mushrooms right now. <laughs> that's what it felt well, like. Well, that's to me. what they're for. <laughs> no, it's supposed to be a micro. People yeah, but, are eating yeah. microdoses like it's Adderall now. People yeah. are trying to tell you yeah. that it's like a yeah. functionality thing. It's like you're an addict. You're like, oh, it'll be, you'll be fine. You'll be normal. It'll just be a little heightened senses. I'm like, oh, okay. I, I did one of those ultra marathons where you like run forever. And, Jesus uh, Christ. Yeah, 68 miles. And uh, a couple of the guys were microdosing the whole way. 
I believe it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Navy SEALs apparently microdose a lot. Yeah. That's what I've heard. We had a Navy SEAL if- coming with us that dropped out. Like right before we went, he's like, I can't do it, guys. And we're like, why not? He's like, I don't want to get hurt. Like, Is he an active duty? No, no, no. He's not active Uh-oh. duty anymore. Former Navy SEAL. Man, I thought Navy SEALs were tough. Yeah. That guy dropping out. Look, I, I know a bunch of them, and they are fucking tough. They, I'll arm wrestle them right now. Yeah? I'm not very good at arm I, wrestling. Uh, I was going to. I watched Andy Dick and Jim Jeffries arm wrestle. That was pretty good. It ended, <laughs> ended, 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 ended with a kiss. I would sure imagine. Did. In my head, I would think. Jim would win. Yeah. But but Andy would do something like grab his dick or something or stick his finger up his ass. Lick his arm or something. Yeah. I think they made out. I think that's how it ended. Do you have any Andy Dick stories hitting on you, either of you? Everybody, I, I could everybody see Andy else. Dick trying to fuck you. Every single person in <laughs> Los Angeles. One time he was drunk and I was in the bathroom at the Hollywood Improv peeing and he said nice ass to me. That's that the closest yeah. I got. He he. Uh, there was a girl doing a documentary called Andy Dick Stories. How everybody has an Andy Dick story. Mm-hmm. And literally, every I have like twelve. He jerked off in my bed. With um, you in it? No, I was. Uh, he came to my house. He was sober at the time. Started drinking. Next thing you know, we're all partying. Uh, he they go back to my house. I went to my girlfriend's house, who's my wife now. And like Andy lived in my house for like three days. We couldn't get rid of him. Oh. And. Uh, uh, I'd see him. I'd be like walking around Venice. I'd see him having lunch. He'd be like an outdoor patio and be like, hey, Andy. He'd be like, oh my God. He's like, I just jerked off in your bed. And I'm like, will you please leave so I can go home? And uh, he's like, you don't have any lube. Um, I ended up, we ended up calling his manager at the time and having his manager come get him and remove him from our house. God, what a job that is. Yeah. Being and the crazy thing, manager. his son is so normal. Andy Dick's son's the most normal. What's his son's yeah. name? I used to see him a lot. Lucas. Lucas. Yeah. Is he still around? I don't think so. I haven't seen him in years, but I remember when he was around, he was like the most chill, yeah, he's normal nice guy. Probably raised by the mother, I would yeah, imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. I hope so for his sake. Well, I remember once I went to see Andy, we did a podcast. It, it, he was at a sober living establishment. And I remember one of his kids was also living there, like in oh, sober living. So I guess they both didn't turn out normal. He, I think Andy should just permanently live at a sober living house. Andy's one of the funniest, most talented people in the world. Like, yeah. if he could get his shit together, he could win an Academy Award. He's yeah. so brilliant. I, I feel think... like you don't hang around that long fucking up that much unless you're supremely talented. He is so fucked Even up. Even if though. he got his shit together, I think it's too late. He fucked up too many times. He's burnt too much every bridge. Yeah, like Robert Downey Jr. was like that, and then it just stopped. Mm-hmm. And he's still a weirdo, mm-hmm. but he's so talented. Yeah. And Andy was the same way. But Andy couldn't stop. He just can't. Robert Downey Jr., he did stand up too, right? Or no? I don't know if he did. He was on Saturday Night Live, I think. Yeah, he was was on the shitty year. Yeah, like 84 or whatever. That that. was the Anthony Michael Hall year. The year Lauren wasn't there or something. Jay Moore was that. Yeah, Lauren Lauren left and the guy that ran like NBC Sports came over and took it over. I forget who it was. Yeah, those were the weird that was the weirdest year of SNL. Meanwhile, Julia all... Louise Dreyfus, did you say that? I think she was there. Yeah. She think, was on it? Oh, yeah. I think Janine and, Garofalo yeah, no. might have been on that, no, that was later, I think. That was you the nineties sh- probably. Look it up. It was the weirdest yeah. the weirdest year ever. Yes, there's a lot of weird years there. No, that, that people don't think about that was the weirdest one. Yeah, because Lauren Michaels wasn't doing it. But that. still made stars. Shows the power of SNL. Even the non Lauren years, the weird years. It's amazing. Still it stars. still made stars for as many years as it has. Yeah. Maybe it still will. Is there so, anything? So do you help anyone? Do you think you've ever helped anyone? Uh, probably not. I can't think of one that I actually help. Is that, do you consider that like one of your talents? Helping people? Yeah. No, but I li- I care. I like to help people. Yeah. But I don't think I'm very good at it. So that was your idea for a podcast. You're like, I'm going to help people. That was just, I like the name of it and the idea. It's basically turned into just shooting the shit for an hour and yeah. then one little segment is me helping that's all a but podcast yeah. is and yeah. there are so many times where i've had conversations with people like out in the middle of nowhere that i'm like fuck i wish this was recorded you know I'm yeah like, mm-hmm. someone could hear it but then there are so many that i do that i force that i'm like i feel sorry for anyone that's ever spent an hour listening to my bullshit mm-hmm. yeah off the podcast i say a lot more racist things but I just tone it down. Are racism. you racist? You no, I just like, I just, I'm like a classic comedian, you know? Yeah, I, I, love, I like I love homophobia, r- misogyny, Yeah, racism. I love that stuff, and I'm, yeah. I think it's going to make a huge comeback. I hope so. I don't think it will. No, I really do. I really do, because I think people have gone so woke that they're going to realize there's like an art to that. 
And the art is that like, in order to do that, you can't be that. Like, yeah, you can't be. Yeah. Racist then it wouldn't all. be funny. Yeah. I was with, uh, I was on a date last night and I made, and she was an Asian girl and I made an Asian joke. And she's younger than me. She's in her early 20s. And she goes, that's such a dad joke. And I'm like, oh. that's a dad joke? Oh, yeah. she got you, though, because yeah. it wasn't clever enough. I was watching. Um, <laughs> who was I watching? And I'm like, they've done it so well. Like the, oh, um, Curtin, um, Kyle, with the pussies. Have you seen their Instagram? Mm. Oh, Kyle yeah, Dunnigan's. Yeah. Oh, Dunnigan. oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, they've, amazing. They've, they've just done it yeah. so, so Incredible. well. And. I was because I'm always looking at it like I think this is a great time. I this is the best time for comedy ever. When everyone's like, "Oh, it's, I hate when people." It must be so hard for you. I'm like, "What are you talking about? This is the greatest time ever." Because <laughs> there's like so many people to offend, and everybody gets so upset. That's true. That's a good way to look at it. It's the best time yeah. ever. And it's like if you're not if you're only funny enough to be funny in one lane, like when someone's like, "Oh, you you have you can't be offensive. You have to worry." I'm like, "Yeah, but you if you're funny, you should be able to be yeah. funny even." If you can't do offensive jokes, you should still be able to be funny if you're a comedian. Yeah, and I just think that this is like so much fucking fun. Like it's so crazy that that people get upset by this or that. And it's like, well, okay. So I don't know. I just, somebody's going to come out that's going to be like full on. Dice Clay 2.0. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. And they are going to hit so hard. And be so big. I mean, because Chappelle's kind of doing that. Like, the conservatives love Chappelle right mm -hmm. now because he was the first guy to, like, talk about transgenders and talk about this and that. And it does – some of his stuff comes off as ignorant. You're like, ooh, you know, like, Dave. Like, yeah, I mean, he is, like, a 50-year-old guy. He's yeah, not going to sound yeah. like a 20-year-old. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but there's going to be someone who's, like, just say – as long as it's funny. Tim Dillon a little bit, kind of, is doing it, riding the line. Yeah, yeah, but he's riding I, that he, centrist line. I'd never heard of the guy till like recently. I didn't know who he's he was. He's popping off. He's brilliant. Is he? He's so he's, fucking funny. Is he really? Yeah. He uh, can turn it on. I barely like, find anybody funny anymore. But he's funny. He's There's funny. I just heard funny. him on Rogan and he sounded like he gives really strong opinions that, yes. that have no basis to them. Like they're yeah, some of them do, some the of them don't. The basis is comedy. His opinion is always based on what's the funniest take. Then that's great. Then yeah, I like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's no, how it should be. He's not preaching anything. No, I don't like preaching. Or no, I don't yeah, like, he makes fun of both sides. And I don't like people that have the statistics like to back it up because it's like, that's not our job. Yeah, yeah. You know, like I don't want to hear you. I don't want to hear that you can spout off fucking. You know, like yeah. if I went and like anti-vaxxer shit with mm -hmm. you, you know, I like, don't know anything. Yeah, yeah. I I always say at the end of the day, I'm an idiot. So yeah, me so too. don't ever like. I gave some girl advice the other day, some girl that opened for me and and I felt like after I apologized afterwards. I'm like, don't ever listen to anything I say. <laughs> I, I drove to a gig in San Diego t on Saturday without shoes. I had, like I your whole car into, ride? I had to walk into Nordstrom Rack in my socks and buy shoes. So no I'm not about way. to tell you my opinion. That was this weekend? That was this weekend. That's Saturday. hilarious. Look how new these shoes are. I like They're them. Nice. Yeah, they look good. They're, They're simple. Brand new. Classic. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the same way. Even the older I get, you think I have, you think I have wisdom. Nobody should ever take my advice. No, no. Ever. You ever. should figure out a way to say that on stage. I uh, The way I dressed it that night on the show, I was like, I was going to do a bit about the vaccine, and then I realized I drove here with no shoes on, so I'm going to shut up. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about something else. Is there anything you want to plug before you get out of here, Eddie? Oh, I think. Um, oh, my you special. If you live in Australia. No. Um, uh, what do I have coming up? I have a whole tour. A whole tour? I'm gone from uh, the 1st of September. Road until, dogging it. Hey, you were saying get away from the wife and kids. Till the end of January. I think you got that covered then. Oh, and I will be shooting a new special. This is probably the date. January 22nd at the Irvine Improv. Sweet. That's exciting. But I'm in like every city from here to Key West, Florida. I mean, I'm going from Anchorage, Alaska to Key West, Florida in the next five months so Badass. all my all my dates are at eddieift.com all right check him out he's really funny i remember no, i already knew no, who you were no, no tim dylan <laughs> no he won't be there opening for you no i'm no tim dylan yeah, yeah, yeah. he's yeah the, whole, there i remember be more than one of that i it's set up that awful. camera system at the ice house and i knew who you were but never really had watched your stuff i just had heard of you and then i was editing clips just watching your set and most people i watched their set and maybe i could get a clip or two out of it 
and your set just very punchy you know i i edited like six videos of it because just oh every single one could have been a clip if that makes sense so well, it, was, I, it, was, I, it was very I, impressive i appreciate that really i, I always think i suck <laughs> i do and i think that no one cares and no one likes me so i appreciate that first no, time i really... ever heard your name was on opie and anthony for the patrice they hated me well i felt like they were being nice about it but at the patrice memorial episode Jim Norton quoted Patrice going, Eddie if it should have been Eddie Ugh. <laughs> yeah, but Joy, that, that was that like was kind of that's that like a Don Rickles joke. I that love did, it. that didn't hurt me. I love the ugh, because we would all do that all the time. <laughs> yeah. At the comedy cellar at the table, like when somebody would be talking, you'd just go, ugh. Yeah. You know, like and so one night I was I tell this story all the time. I was on stage at the comedy cellar, and I don't know if you guys have been there and mm -hmm. how you gotta yeah, yeah. walk to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. I'm on stage and they're maybe like I was like usually on late. It's like 20 people in the crowd. Norton goes walking past me and he looks at me right in the face while I'm on stage. And he's like as far as me to you because there's there's <laughs> only small. one one table and yeah. then the walkway. Yeah. So Norton walks by, turns and looks at me and goes, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> while, while I'm on stage. Yeah, the audience is like, what? He goes to the bathroom. He pisses or whatever. I'm back into my act. He walks by me again and I think he's not doing it again. And he turns back. He looks at me. He goes, double ugh. <laughs> See, for me, that would be like a gold badge. And then he and then he just left, and it was like, ha. Oh. And Burr always talks about how I, he goes, I don't know why he attributes this to me all the time, and I don't even remember saying it. He goes, Eddie Ift always used to say that when, he, when he'd come in the cellar, if Patrice was there, he would turn around and leave. Like, because I would, cause I would, I said it. Like, <laughs> you'd see him at the table and you're like, this just isn't going to be a good experience. <laughs> and so you would just leave because you're like, I'm not going to have fun there. I'm going to get, he's going to torture me. Because even if you could make fun of him, like Voss is so much fun to go back yeah. and forth with. Norton crushes you almost all the time but you like like Nortons because mm -hmm. they're so witty. Patrice wasn't fun because he would smash you. And when you would go back at him, he would talk louder than you. Right. And so I always say it was like, if you went to hear like, I don't know, fucking uh, James Taylor and Megadeth play at the same time, you're not going to know what kind of musician James Taylor is. Right. Because Megadeth's just playing over them. That was Patrice. He was Megadeth. You right. couldn't, you, you would start to talk and he'd go, ah! This guy thing, and you're like, are you gonna let me? You, there was no time to get one in, and it was bullying, and right. everybody liked. I feel like everybody was such a pussy because comics really. Let's talk about the strength of character of comedians. Mm -hmm. They would take Patrice's side because they didn't want to be on the other side of it, so they would take his side. So it was just it wasn't fun. Where if it was like Voss, it's like, oh my god, this is gonna be so fun because he was tit for tat. He's good at. I mean, that whole documentary about Patrice. I didn't know him. I just, you know, watched his specials, and they were great. But the whole documentary, it didn't really shed the best light on him. And a lot, like right. a lot of people were saying the same thing. They're just like, the, oh, he well, I'm glad intense. I didn't even watch it because I yeah. didn't like him that much. Yeah. And and I thought he was a good comic. I didn't think he was a great comic. I've seen mm -hmm. like much better. But there were a bunch of guys. You know, his whole crew put him on this pedestal. If he was the greatest ever. And I'm like, I never saw it. And all I ever saw him do was mean things and make people cry. And like, it wasn't <laughs> that, fun. That's what a lot of people said. That's nah. the through line of this episode. Yeah. You go where you wanted. I <laughs> ran, <laughs> well, I ran yeah. into him in LA once and he was at Mel's diner. And I'm, I'm like, I walk in and it was just like the side. I was like, oh, fuck, I got to leave. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to sit down. And so I'm sitting up and he goes, Eddie Ift. And I'm like, oh, fuck. And he goes, come here. And I was like, here we go. And I sat down and we had like the nicest dinner. And I was like, that was weird. Why, why are you not a dick anymore? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, did you decide yeah. not to be a dick? But at least you have the one. I'm glad movie. I'm going to watch the documentary now because I always thought I was the only one. The documentary was not just kissing his ass the whole time. Okay. It talked about his, you know, the good things about him, but it talked about this. Because I thought like, here I am. And O and A, the whole thing goes back to like, the O and A fans, like that subreddit group, just mm -hmm. they were Toxic. like whatever those guys started. Like if Patrice did this or Jim, they all followed it. And Jim Norton's always been nice to me. He's done some really good things for me, and you know, nice guy. Um, but like those guys would like make fun of me a lot, and it, a lot of it came down to you know just 
I was a younger guy. There were a million reasons. I, mm-hmm. I brought it on myself a lot. You know, there was a million reasons. But they, you know, like the subreddit group, those guys aren't in the trenches with you, so they don't know. Right. And they all would come at me then. And I still, like when I started the podcast with Jim, they came to our podcast from O&A because of Jim. So then they would come at me all the time. And I'm right. like, oh, fuck these guys. And to this day, the, the like trolls that were there that are, went to here, they're still out there. <laughs> they're just fans of like a new show now. Yeah. And they're coming at me from there. And I'm just like, ugh, they're 50 it, year old trolls. But it all started from like, they were a Patrice fan, you yeah. know, like, and because Patrice said this, they're going, and I was they're like, trying to make him happy up in heaven. Yeah. And I'm like, you're not, <laughs> Patrice wouldn't fucking piss on you yeah. if he saw you <laughs> that's what the greatest thing uh, uh trolls Jake, are the worst uh doug stanhope one time wrote a letter to doug you should try to find this on the internet it's uh a letter to dane cook an open mm-hmm. letter to dane cook and he just talks about dane like he, it's like addressed to dane it's it's hard and he's like basically saying like why he doesn't like dane and at the very end he goes but to all my fans that write and trash dane or this or that i want you to know that if I walked into a comedy club and there was you and there was him, I would talk to Dane. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And it's, it's so, so true. true. Yeah. It's so true. So these fans that think they're like on, you know what I'm like? Yeah, you think you're like in the inner circle laughing? Yeah. It's like, you're no, not. you're not in the circle. All right, well, thanks for doing the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. It was Appreciate awesome. It. Yeah, I'm, it was try- I'm, I'm trying to keep it going so I don't have to go home. <laughs> have fun with the, have fun in the pool and the elevators. You're listening to, you're listening to unlicensed, 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 unlicensed therapy with Ari Manis. Ari Manis.